In this concluding lecture, we confront the largest and most difficult question of all in our study of the First World War. What was the true meaning, legacy, and overall significance of the Great War? What lessons can be taken away from this? In this lecture, we'll start by examining the structural impact, the economic, social, and political outcomes of the conflict, as well as the individual human impact of this disaster. And ultimately, one conclusion powerfully presents itself, inaugurating a cycle of worldwide violence for the rest of the 20th century, as this seminal catastrophe has been called, as it's been called of the 20th century, the First World War represented a true watershed in the devaluation of human life, the downgrading of individuality in favor of larger collective power, especially in the hands of the state, and it created ultimately a surge in our own terrible knowledge of what humans are capable of, as well as a keener sense of the tragic fragility of human progress, because we've seen the spectacle of an entire civilization turned against itself. In examining the structural impact in economics, there were fascinating outcomes from the war, as well as certain benefits paradoxically, to some countries. In the global economy, Europe had come to lose its earlier centrality. It lost markets to other countries and took on debt as well in order to pay the vast costs of a total war. In the process, the United States became the most important trading nation, and it's sometimes been said that in a sense, perhaps the United States was the only victor of the First World War. In a symbolic as well as financial sense, New York became the financial capital of the world, displacing London from this earlier position of honor. In addition, many non-European economies of countries that had been involved in the war or uh, only fueling its economic energies also boomed during the war, and cycles of dependency on more developed European economies also were broken uh, by developing countries worldwide. In social terms, the demographic impact of the war was huge, with 9 to 10 million killed and twice that number wounded, many maimed for life. It's estimated that the war, and the, the numbers here are not entirely uh, clear, one has to speculate on this, that the war left some 3 million widows and 10 million orphans as well. There were certainly common anxieties felt in post-war societies about the demographic imbalances between the sexes uh, that were uh, feared and the notion that the very best individuals had been those killed in the war. All of these notions haunted societies. Now, demographic historians have pointed out that the picture that emerges from statistics is a good deal uh, less dramatic. They argue that contrary to the notion of a permanent entire generation missing from the demographic picture, and the common images of the time of an entire generation of young women without potential husbands doomed to a, a life alone, that this in fact doesn't match what the statistics tell us about the demographic consequences of the First World War. In fact, they argue that uh, relationships nonetheless presented themselves and that this uh, gap in the demographic statistics uh, over time closed or healed. Uh, nonetheless, what very clearly is being presented here had a certain psychological significance for societies that had such fears or anxieties. And that was the notion that social elites, who earlier would have felt the, uh, a sort of noblesse oblige to lead a society, these had been severely damaged by the war itself, and that in some sense a negative selection, as some social Darwinists worried, had taken place as the most idealistic, those who were most motivated, had gone off to war and had died. At the same time, the conception of women's roles was dramatically altered. Social historians are very careful to point out that phenomena like the involvement of women in great numbers in production for war industry, in heavy industrial work in the factories, uh, was often something that was reversed after the war ended, as soldiers whose positions had been filled by women entering these particular branches of industry returned and take, uh, took their jobs back again. Uh, at the same time as this sort of surge into the workforce might have been reversed, one thing again was clear psychologically. The notion of what it was that women were capable of, the roles they could take on, 
had drastically changed. And one could see this as well in the notion of, finally, the recognition of women's political voice in the right to vote. Politics also clearly had been transformed by the sheer experience of this total war. The power of the state, of governments, what the state was expected to do or seen as able to do, certainly had increased profoundly. And doctrines of classical liberalism, which had emphasized the restraint of the state, the model of a limited state in a constitutional form, were badly damaged as a result of the First World War. The state had been both necessary and had shown what it was capable of. The militarization of politics, moreover, in the style, language, and ideology of mass movements uh, that gained ever greater currency in the post-war period had also resulted from the experience of war itself. The international balance of power was also affected by the war and its outcome. In a negative sense, in fact. In terms of geopolitics, the war had not resolved what many contemporaries saw as the fatal flaw in the balance of power that had led, indeed, to the outbreak of the First World War. This is what contemporaries had earlier called the German problem. The question of whether a large and dynamic and modern and uh, progress-filled German state at the center of the European continent would be a force for disorder or, on the contrary, an anchor of stability. In some sense, Germany remained as this uh, mysterious factor in the balance of power at the center of the continent, still, even though it had been defeated, with massive potential military and clearly industrial power as well. The French politician Georges Clemenceau was very keenly aware of this. He quipped, indeed, uh, at the end of the war, that the German problem is that there are 20 million too many of them. But the Versailles Treaty itself didn't change this. The potential power of Germany was still outsized for the balance of power as it had existed before. With his uh, particular gift for paradoxes, the British historian A.J.P. Taylor argued earlier that Germany, in fact, in a relative sense, came out of the First World War stronger in terms of the balance of power than it had been before 1914. Uh, just to pursue uh, his love of paradox a little bit together, how did that argument run? A.J.P. Taylor suggested that before the war, in 1914, Germany had been one of five European great powers. It had been one of many players in the balance of power. After the war, it was the strongest of three remaining European great powers still standing. After the collapse of Austria-Hungary, after the collapse of Russia, which though it potentially could be a great power at this point, seemed to be out of the equation, in terms of European politics, there remained Germany and France and Great Britain. Germany, moreover, Taylor argued, was likely upon its recovery sometime in the future to economically dominate the continent and perhaps also later in political and military terms. France was keenly aware of this. It didn't need A.J.P. Taylor to point this out. France faced the problem of confronting some point in the future and eventually revived Germany demographically stronger and larger, industrial and militarily powerful. And many French politicians, as well as the, the general mood of the French population, was often dispirited by the enormity of this future challenge, as well as the sheer scale of the sacrifice that the French people had offered up in human terms, in terms of the dead in the First World War. And this demoralization, certainly contributed to the disastrous fall of France during the Second World War. Moreover, an unstable German state that emerged in the, the troubled experiment with German democracy, as it turns out, would again produce crisis later in the 20th century. In general, at the same time, fascinating things had been happening internationally. In general, the earlier mighty colonial empires that European nations had amassed in the later 19th century in particular, these empires themselves and their legitimacy were increasingly being called into question around the globe. And later in the 20th century, there would be an entire process of what we call decolonization as empires broke down and as national independence was achieved 
by non-European peoples around the globe as well. Well, this process of decolonization to a great extent ideologically began right in this period of the First World War. Think of the ideological charge that we've been at pains to point out was operating, especially from 1917, during the First World War itself, the notion of a revolutionary message of self-determination of peoples. And if self-determination was a key ideological slogan, then it was one that didn't apply just to European nations, not just to Belgium, not just to a Czechoslovakia, but applied as a universal principle. And though delayed, as a result of the, the compromises of the Versailles Treaty and the Paris Settlement, nonetheless, this ideological charge of self-determination would infuse the energies and the aspirations of once colonized peoples to win their independence later in the 20th century. Uh, just to illustrate some of the changes that were taking place, accelerating in mentalities in this regard, Australian patriots came to consider the Gallipoli landing the founding moment of an independent Australian national identity. And we could add many more such examples growing out of the First World War to this list. At the same time in international politics, we need to keep in mind that a new kind of state had emerged, the Soviet Union, which pursued its revolutionary agenda in international politics, which was nothing less than the obliteration of the existing order to produce a new one. Let's turn now from these seemingly bloodless structural and economic and uh, international political aspects to consider the human impact of the war. The war had battered earlier common notions that had been prized by European civilization in the 19th century of progress, growing out of the advance of technology and the advance of social organization coupled with liberal ideas which privileged the independence and the talents of the individual. To the contrary, the growth of the state during the First World War of necessity and its massive potential coercive power made a sheer mockery of earlier liberal ideas of the notion of a limited state and a private sphere for the individual. The state had proven that it could mobilize and interfere in the lives of millions. At the same time, there were also effects on the mass psychology and in the intellectual history of European civilization. After the First World War, contemporaries spoke at length of their feeling of great disillusionment. The increasing questioning of all great ideals and great words, all faiths and all earlier certainties. And it seemed to be typical of the time that so many thinkers would resort to irony as a way of hiding their despair over what had been revealed by the First World War. At the same time, extremely insightful contemporary historians today have been, I think, giving us a, um, a healthy warning of needing to be skeptical about this entire narrative of disillusionment and having been lied to and manipulated by governments. The reality, as attested to in the sources from the First World War that are vivid to us, is that most certainly, a common sense of ideological charge and enthusiasm had infused the first participation in the war, whatever later disillusionment might have followed. This spontaneous mobilization of European societies with enthusiasm for this war was something that many people didn't care to remember afterwards and perhaps hid in this narrative of disillusionment. Historians are also still debating today a, a difficult question whether a process of brutalization had taken place both on an individual and a collective civilizational level as a result of the enormous violence of the war. This question is tremendously difficult to get at. Those historians who are skeptical of the thesis of, of an entire social process of brutalization taking place during the war point out that um, it's difficult to show evidence of uh, some increase of mass murders or of domestic violence as a result of the return of soldiers. They point out, and, and they're right on this score, that many soldiers returned to their civilian lives and seemed at least uh, to outward appearances to return to a kind of normalcy or find a way of living after the war. At the same time as it's difficult to quantify or find conclusive evidence for a process of brutalization, there nevertheless are very suggestive instances. To outline some of those, contemporaries themselves spoke of a certain hardening of the spirit that they detected in their own societies, the way in which people were becoming desensitized to the scenes of war, the images of mass violence, 
and how the inhuman increasingly seemed normal. How human life was regarded and valued perhaps thus changed as a result of the war. The knowledge of what could be done to human beings changed how human beings were regarded and thought of. The Battle of Verdun is a key example. If human beings could be fed in, the, in their masses into an enormous grinder of human beings and a factory of death, didn't that change how we thought of the individual and human dignity as well? Another example that's very suggestive in this regard is the, the changed status of how human life, especially the weakest human life, was regarded in the pressure cooker of total war. It's suggested by current research that neglect in German asylums, the lack of provision of food to the inmates of these asylums during the war itself, in time of blockade and of shortage, resulted in the deaths by starvation as well as disease of some 70,000 inmates in what amounted to passive euthanasia. So in Germany, long before the Nazis came to power with their explicit aim of crafting a master race and eliminating those whom they called life unworthy of living, euthanasia as a social tool was already being discussed, in part as a way of rationing scarce resources in a cost-benefit analysis. Two years after the war, in 1920, in defeated Germany, one book was published that shows some of this trajectory and made the logic inherent in this process very clear. This book was entitled Permission for the Destruction of Life Unworthy of Living. It was produced by a lawyer by the name of Carl Binding, who offered legal arguments for euthanasia, and a psychiatrist named Alfred Hoche, who offered medical arguments in the same direction. Hoche had lost his son at Langemark, the, that famous nationalist encounter about which legends were created from the start of the war, where allegedly German idealistic students had gone into battle singing the German national anthem and sacrificed themselves. Out of this tragedy, perhaps, these authors advocated, quite explicitly, the killing of the unfit. And the experiences of the First World War were held up as part of this argument. If it was the case that in the First World War, fit people had died, what was the complexion of the society that resulted uh, after this process of selection? What was to happen with those whom the war had left unfit as a result of the way in which they were damaged? And moreover, uh, they argued, uh, had turned them into lives unworthy of life, in, at least in their perspective. Very clearly, how human life was regarded was altered in the perspective of many. Finally, there's the question of ideology that we need to consider. In spite of the fact that the First World War long had been considered to be more in the nature of a traditional war involving territory and politics rather than ideas, in ideological terms, long before the Cold War of later decades of the 20th century, in our own experience, it was already in this period that the emerging superpowers of the United States and the Soviet Union presented models for modernity what a new world would be like for the 20th century. Very different models, that of democracy and that of communism. And yet at the same time, these rivals had things in common in the sense that they both promised to abolish the earlier way of doing things. In particular, both urged a new worldwide order, whether it was democratic politics worldwide, which it was hoped would bring peace, or the abolition of capitalism and a worldwide workers' revolution. Both abolished earlier concepts of the balance of power and tried instead to craft a new world order. This was felt by contemporaries at the time. And one contemporary hauntingly observed in, in a phrase that I think really captures this, that people of his time increasingly needed to make a choice, a choice between Woodrow Wilson and Vladimir Lenin a choice between Wilson's democratic ideas and Lenin's announcement of international revolution. This entire process also, uh, it, with a sort of grim, grim fortune, was also trundling towards World War II. In spite of the manifest horrors of the First World War and all that it had revealed about what total industrial war would be like, Europe hurtled towards the Second World War a mere 21 years later. But when the war broke out, it did so without the naive celebrations of the 1914 August Madness. And that, by the way, was something that infuriated Adolf Hitler. 
that the German people did not celebrate and cheer the outbreak of the Second World War. He came to worry about whether the German people were up to his plans, and in addition about whether a, another stab in the back, which he believed in, wouldn't result. The trends of the first total war in World War I would now be intensified in World War II with more destructive weaponry and technology, even less inhibited targeting of civilians, even more total mobilization of all of the energies of societies for total war or total defeat. The contemporary historian Omer Bartov advances a pessimistic but haunting argument about the inner logic of such modern industrial war. He suggests that once invented, once put into practice, industrial war and industrial killing that accompany it inevitably are repeated and refined. Once total war has been invented, it's not possible to uninvent it or unknow it or unthink it. And, he suggests, in a dialectic process, genocide, the killing of civilian populations because of who they are, represents a perfected form of industrial killing. So that in a sense, the trenches of World War I, Bartov suggests, and the death camps of World War II are linked by an infernal logic. If killing in the trenches of World War I was efficient, the far more efficient and safer for the killers form of mass murder are the death camps of World War II. The lives of many actors of the Second World War had also been decisively shaped by the First War, and their decisions were affected by it. This obviously involved millions of people. To pick out just a few particularly suggestive cases, before World War II, the experience of the future French defense minister, André Maginot, at the huge Battle of Verdun, had helped create the massive fortifications to which his name would be given, the ill-fated Maginot Line, which Nazi armies slammed through at the start of the Second World War. Winston Churchill's urgings to aim for the soft underbelly of Nazi Europe during World War II in some sense revived an earlier idea he had, the impulse that had led to the failed landings at Gallipoli in 1915. And likewise, his urging of intervention against the Bolsheviks immediately after World War I was echoed in his later suspicions of communism and Stalin. The French leader Charles de Gaulle, also a veteran of the Battle of Verdun, had learned the moral power of resistance and willed greatness against material odds that he would put into practice in World War II and after. And while it's clearly not possible to totally plumb the psychology of a dictator like Hitler to understand fully how his experience of World War I shaped him, it's important that he recalled it as a time of greatness that he wanted to recover. Likewise, Hitler's decision not to use poison gas in World War II was probably affected by his experiences, not out of humanitarian motives, but rather out of fear of precisely what had happened in World War I, allied retaliation with superior technology and weaponry. Finally, we come to a key question, the implications for our own times, beyond the resonance of the lead-up to World War II. And this notion of the implications for our own times has itself been one of the main themes of our course. Beyond its formative impact on World War II, the implications of the Great War continue to reverberate for us today. And in part, we ourselves need to make some conclusions about what the war means for us. This also has been one of the largest themes of the course, the many different meanings assigned to the war while it was going on, as well as afterwards. The ideological dimension of the Great War itself continues to work itself out in world history, as it has throughout the 20th century. And this, again, underlines another major theme of our course, the importance of ideology. The Cold War, which endured into our own times and shaped the lives of billions of people around the world, actually began not just after World War II, but in fact was already present in 1917, in that key moment of world history. And we still live today with the consequences of that apocal struggle and also seek to understand the history that we've lived through. At the same time, the claims of nationalism, demands for self-determination, and the ethnic aspirations which came to the fore in World War I and played such an important role in its outbreak are still present today as well, worldwide. In spite of the repeated prophecies of the end of nationalism and its fading, it's still with us stronger than ever. And indeed, we could point to particular regions around the world where regional strife, which inevitably affects our globalized context as well, whether in the Middle East or the Balkans or in Ireland or in former colonial era, uh, areas, they're all still with us, part of the legacy of fractured empires.
ones that broke apart in the First World War. Indeed, even a venture like today's attempts at European unification, the European Union, are often propelled by the serious determination to transcend the power politics and nationalism which helped ignite world wars. A vivid symbolic event of this that just underlines it uh, with great eloquence came in 1984 when the German Chancellor, Helmut Kohl, and the French President, François Mitterrand, met at Verdun and there in this site, holy to the experience of both peoples in the ordeal of the First World War, in an eloquent and quiet gesture, each one gripped the hand of the other in a gesture of solidarity and an implicit promise that this sort of disaster would not follow again. Finally, we want to address the question of the legacy of the totality of this total war. This has been a, another very important theme of our course throughout. The totality of the war, paradoxically, is difficult for us to fully understand as we might and we need to, precisely because our own identities, our own understandings of ourselves and the world have been shaped by the experience of that total war and the totality it revealed. In some sense, World War I is still part of us. And what I mean by that is this. It includes the understanding of the power of the state which experienced such a dramatic expansion in World War I. The state retains that expansive role. What we think the state can do, or should do, we'd like it to do, or what the state can get away with doing, is most certainly in our psychology a legacy of that vast expansion of the First World War. It's also unfortunately the case, and this is so nightmarish that we probably only are able to deal with this by often simply pushing it to some darker reaches of our consciousness and ignoring it, is our own existential reality with the threat of the totality of war ever present in our own age of weapons of mass destruction, whether the ones we deploy or ones deployed by potential enemies. Total war, which in 1914 was a novelty, but in the years afterwards and in World War II has now been practiced and perfected is, we must recognize, an ever-present apocalyptic dimension to modern life and what it means for us to exist in our own times. That apocalyptic dimension is somehow, at the same time, both unimaginable, inconceivable, and nightmarish, and yet somehow self-evident and obvious as well. What then can we say by way of lessons of this entire man-made tragedy the seminal catastrophe, the original catastrophe of the 20th century. Many thinkers have spoken of the world wars, both of them, sometimes even as a, a 30 years conflict of the 20th century, as representing something very profound, not just conflicts that had military and political reasons, but rather as a larger civil war of Western civilization. Some even speak of a suicide attempt of Western civilization. Civil wars, by their very anguished nature, are fought over large questions, existential questions, questions of identity, what does it mean to be us, and questions of ideology. And to truly understand the Great War and its long-term legacy, we need to take that ideological dimension seriously, as we've been arguing throughout the course, as a war in which contemporaries felt an intense stake and were willing to sacrifice, die, and kill in. That most certainly was not a war about nothing, but a war which had existential stakes. And the spectacle of a civilization making war on itself, it scarcely needs to be said, offers a paradoxical scene. The strange and terrible, vivid tableau of tremendous resources devoted to destruction. Resources of qualities of, of human characteristics that we consider as good, creativity, determination, sacrifice, a sense of solidarity, all of this being offered up for the purpose of destruction. And so at the end of this terrible cautionary tale, our study of the First World War, one is left with the one profound wish that these inner resources, passion, sacrifice, determination, solidarity, could be used to better, more peaceful and constructive purposes than war. And that truly is the most basic and human conclusion of our course of study on the First World War.